Oh, Sarah, should I introduce you as Dr. Gagne? Yeah, sure. That's good. Thank you. Good afternoon, folks, and welcome to today's Lunchtime Discovery Series. My name is Erin Apple. I work as the Coordinator of Youth Programs here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in downtown Raleigh. And today I am guest hosting for Chris Smith, a wonderful presentation that I'm really looking forward to, and I hope you all are as well. So today we are going to be learning about what is the best place to connect with nature at your door. We're going to be meeting with Dr. Sarah A. Gagne, Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Geography and Earth Sciences at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte and author of Nature at Your Door, Connecting with the Wild and Green in the Urban and Suburban Landscape. Sarah, thank you so much for being here today. It's my real pleasure, thank you. Sarah, would you like to start by um, sharing your screen? Yes, sure. And I mentioned that I'm very excited about this talk today. I myself studied wildlife biology at NC State and now work as an educator. So I'm looking forward to hearing about the wildlife that coexists with us in urban environments. Okay, how is that? That looks good to me. Okay. You can get started whenever you'd like. Okay, excellent. Well, like I said, it's my real pleasure um, to be here today and to share some of my thoughts on urban nature with everyone. So to get started, I thought I would tell you a little bit more about myself. So I am an urban uh, landscape ecologist. And so the type of research that I do is looking at biodiversity patterns over fairly broad spatial scales. And I do that in cities, so in urban places. And what I'm interested in are uh, the effects of things like development patterns, the amount and spatial arrangement of habitat in cities, and how those things influence biodiversity. And I do that um, on a variety of different taxa. So you can see here, there's a picture of me here. This is a recent write-up I had on the Wildlife Society website. And I've done work on invertebrates, ground beetles, uh, coyotes, birds, uh, frogs and toads, a variety of different types of wildlife. So I'm really like an omnivore when it comes to urban ecology. A lot of my research, I try to connect a lot of it to planning practice. And increasingly, I really want to play a role in communicating my and just urban ecology research in general to the public. So whether it's the students that I teach at UNC Charlotte, and most recently, I've published this book, So Nature at Your Door. And the idea behind this is I would really like to show people how deeply they are connected to nature where they live. And then most importantly, how they can impact nature where they live and make a real dent in the biodiversity loss and climate change crises that we're facing. And so that's what the book is for. It's really a handbook with lots of different ways that people can change um, the quality and amount of nature where they live. So today, I wanted to, um, I'm hoping that you'll take home three messages. So three things to take away from my presentation today. The first is that nature is alive and well where you live. I think a lot of us, me included, with lots of my experience looking at urban wildlife, we assume that cities and towns and suburbs are species poor, so that there are few species that live amongst us, that the nature is by definition not of high quality, that we can't find kind of real nature 
in um, cities and towns, urban and suburban places. Well, I think the more research that I do, the more urban ecology research that happens around the world is we're really finding that that is not the case, that cities can be hotbeds of species richness and biodiversity, and that there can be a wealth of ecological processes happening right where we live. Because of that, you can be just as connected to nature in your town or city as elsewhere. So because there is so much high quality nature where you live, you don't need to go to a state park or a nature preserve outside of the city to have deep and meaningful connections with nature. You can do that in your yard, in your neighborhood, at your local park and throughout your city. And then finally, and again, as I said, perhaps most importantly, there are many ways that you can deepen that connection with nature where you live and that you can change the amount of nature that's in your yard, but in your city as well, across your city. So you can enhance nature at your door. And so let's get started looking at these main messages one at a time. And I'm going to start with some spiders. So spiders are a good place to start. Um, and this brings me back to the pandemic. So as many of you during the pandemic, I was um, at home. I have a small, a young son. So I was at home with my son, which in one sense was challenging, but in another sense was a wonderful experience and that we got to spend lots of time together. During that time, because I'm of what I do, we spend a lot of time in the house, but outdoors looking at the different plants and animals that were in our yard. Uh, one of the things I notice, and I'm going to uh, use my mouse, which I think hopefully you should see, was this um, spider, the blue and white and black kind of dramatically marked spider here that I found on my deck. And I thought this looks interesting. So I looked up that spider, and this is a type of ant mimicking spider. These spiders, their body structure looks like ants and they spend their lives in ant nests preying upon ants. And so I thought this was just a, a fascinating and astounding fact type of animal that was living out this interesting life right below my feet. And I was just, just amazed. And so I decided to later on that day, go through and try to find more spiders and see what kinds of species we had in our home. And I found uh, a tan crab spider on my son's desk. I found a really beautiful bold jumping spider with these white markings here um, in our back um, mudroom area, and then another type of jumping spider, I think in the bathroom somewhere. So we were finding all kinds of different things. And I went online and looked for these species. And when I did so, I, find that other, I found that other people were doing a similar thing during the pandemic. And so Matthew Holden is a postdoc in Brisbane, Australia. And during the pandemic, he started the Stay Home Biodiversity Challenge. And he started with spiders as well. They were cleaning out their house and they uh, didn't want to sacrifice the spiders that they were cleaning out of their closets. So they were moving them outdoors and identifying them in the process. And I think one of the um, housemates was an entomologist. So they had quite a few skills, they found many more species than they expected. And then they decided to count all of the species that occurred in their home and yard that they could find. And less than a year after the start of that challenge, they reached a thousand species. And so they um, totaled 747 insect species, 97 plants, 53 birds, 38 spiders, 14 fungi, nine reptiles, eight species of mammal, and two amphibians. And this, I looked it up and asked him, this was on a property only a tenth of an acre. 
So a relatively small yard and house. And to get kind of a sense of that, um, I think a tenth of an acre is 13 parking spaces back to back. So that area. So many more species than he or anyone expected in on his property. So Matthew Holden and his roommates used iNaturalist to identify a lot of these species. And that is an app that you can um, download on your phone. If you haven't done that, it's iNaturalist. It's a fantastic and super fun thing to do. And iNaturalist will help you identify the um, animals and plants and other species that you take photographs of. So it does that using artificial intelligence. It'll suggest different potential species that the photograph could represent. And then it'll also use the power of the community on iNaturalist to help you identify what you think you saw. And so if two thirds of the community um, agree with your species identification, then it becomes research grade. And those observations are actually used by scientists around the world to study um, migration changes with respect to climate, for instance, uh, the spread of invasive species, lots of really interesting and important topics. So what I'm showing you here is a map of Charlotte. And if you haven't been to Charlotte, it might be a little bit difficult, but I've got Uptown Charlotte and our airport as kind of pinpoints to give you a sense of scale. And these are all the iNaturalist observations that have been made in the area. So very, very many of them. Uh, in addition to using iNaturalist to look at, figure out what you've seen, it's also fun to see what's in your area, what other people have seen. And so thinking about how nature is alive and well where you live, I thought I'd look at iNaturalist observations that are centered in uptown Charlotte. So within our 277 belt, the, the place of Charlotte that is really developed where all the high rises are um, really the city center. And so I started looking for species and I came across uh, hermit thrush. This looks like um, it might have collided with a building. So iNaturalist is also really good for tracking, um, you know, mortality and other aspects of biodiversity. This is a woodland species, an eastern whippoorwill, which also clearly collided with a building. That's also a woodland species, probably migrating through the area. Sharp shinned, shot, sharp shinned hawk, a forest species hanging out in uptown Charlotte. Moving into amphibians, there was a bullfrog, a green tree frog doing its best to keep out of sight, a copse gray tree frog. Our state reptile, eastern box turtle, was definitely there, of course. And then I started looking at snakes. So there was a disturbing number of snake species in uptown Charlotte, so decays brown snake, a copperhead, and this was not the only observation. Eastern rat snake, red-bellied snake, common garter snake, common water snake, an eastern worm snake. I think there are even a couple other species in there as well. And then I'm um, looking at mammals. It didn't take me long to find a coyote. So I think this is a capture from one of Mecklenburg County's wildlife cameras that they have out. White-tailed deer, eastern red bat. And then there are a variety of other things. So white striped running crab spider, twin flag jumping spider, green lynx spider, uh, beautiful silk moss, North American luna moth, polyphemus moth, a ground beetle, of course, and then a variety of native plants. So yellow uh, crown beard and Carolina pony's foot. Carolina Pony's foot, I looked into this one. So this is a native ground cover that seems to be very pretty robust. Um, and I'm actually gonna investigate that for my yard because I've seen it around, but I didn't realize what it was. 
And then the other fun thing about iNaturalist is there was clearly someone either doing a project on lichens or who loves lichens. So gold dust lichen was my last observation I'll put up here, but there was a number, there were a number of different species in Uptown Charlotte. So these are just a small sample of uh, the observations and the wildlife species that occur in probably the most developed part of the state. And I'm going to bet that a lot of these you would not have expected to see in that area. And this anecdotal information corroborates bigger studies that have looked at urban biodiversity. So there was one large study that looked at bird and bird and plant species richness in 147 cities across the globe and found that those cities contained about one fifth of Earth's total avian diversity, including 36 threatened bird species. And they also contained about 14,000 plant species, including 65 that were threatened. Another interesting study, which I find fascinating, I met a colleague recently who did a study on small green spaces in the city of Zurich. These are green spaces that were less than 14 feet by 14 feet in area, so pretty small. Those green spaces that he sampled collectively contained 166 um, herbaceous plants, the majority of which were native, just in those small green spaces. And a single small green space could contain at least 30 native plants. And then coming back to the US, there's a recent study that showed that um, every urbanized area in the US with a population of at least 50,000 contained at least one state listed bird species. And 81% of those urbanized areas contained a federally listed bird species. So cities are much more biodiverse than we give them credit for. And um, that really supports this message that I want to get across. So nature is alive and well where you live. And I think the more we look for nature in cities, the more we'll find. So moving on from that observation, nature is alive and well where you live. I'd like to move into a broader understanding of nature in cities. So Cities and suburbs are clearly where humans congregate. We've just seen that they're also where a lot of other species occur. And if we bring those two things together, as well as the physical environment, we can start thinking about living in an urban ecosystem. Just like we have forest ecosystems, there's, there are things called urban ecosystems. And before I define that, I'd like to just review what an ecosystem is. And um, usually in this part of the world, and usually in textbooks that we've been exposed to, we're most familiar with a forest ecosystem. And the forest ecosystem here is dominated by trees. And it's a place, ecosystems in general are places where you're going, you're going to have um, biological components. So living components like trees and other um, animals and fungi and bacteria, et cetera. And they're, they're in um, deep interconnection and related to all the physical components of that space. So the air, water, and minerals. And it's the relationships between the organic and inorganic components that define an ecosystem. So let's look at a few of those relationships because I want you to get a sense for them. And also I want you to, to uh, realize that they're reciprocal, that they're very closely related and occur in a reciprocal kind of give and take manner. So if we think of the trees, our trees are photosynthesizing and respiring. So they're exchanging uh, material with the atmosphere. They're taking in carbon dioxide and water and putting out oxygen when they're photosynthesizing to create more tree, more plant material. But then they're also respiring 
like we do, using some to fill to fulfill their cellular metabolism, and they're putting carbon dioxide and water back out into the atmosphere. So there is a reciprocal exchange there too. And then we think of our animals. Uh, it's fall now in the Carolinas. I don't know about you, but I've seen and heard a squirrel today as I have almost every day for the last several weeks, just going crazy in my yard or somewhere. Our squirrels are in our forest ecosystem. They're collecting acorns, for example. They're either um, using those acorns and ingesting them right away and putting them, using the energy to create more squirrel. Uh, those squirrels are getting, getting uh, predated upon by other animals in the system. Uh, or that acorn is getting um, cached away by the squirrel is either going to turn into another oak tree and continue that cycle, or it's going to get decomposed by this huge army of invertebrates and bacteria and filamentous fungi in the soil into nutrients that will then be taken up by the trees and other vegetation in the forest system. And that decomposition occurs with the squirrel itself and all its predators as well. So everything is linked in this reciprocal cycle of an exchange of energy and nutrients in an ecosystem. So I'd like you to take that conception of the interrelation of biotic and uh, abiotic elements and then translate it to this type of landscape. So this is a typical corner in a suburb in Charlotte. And this is where we have our urban ecosystem. So we were we are all living in this urban ecosystem. And this urban ecosystem is where uh, there is an interconnected web of living organisms and the environment in which humans play a large role. So we've got my our humans here and we're interconnected with other species like birds and also the physical environment. So our air, water and minerals. And then we've got lots of complicated connections among those elements. You can see that we've added a lot of different elements to an urban ecosystem that didn't occur in the forest. We add all of our houses and other buildings and structures. Uh, we've got a road here. Um, you can think of the vehicles, all the people themselves as well. Uh, power lines. You can think also of all the um, animal and plant species that are associated with humans and, and come to where we live, either intentionally or intentionally, so exotic species and otherwise. Uh, you can think of all the human activities that we're adding to this space as well. So driving our vehicles, uh, mowing our lawn, uh, fertilizing and watering our gardens, uh, the lights that we use to light our structures, uh, the noise that we produce just being humans, all of those elements are added to the urban ecosystem and create, like I said, a lot of different um, interactions among elements. And the one thing, um, not the one thing, but one thing that we don't expect that's also added to urban ecosystems are what I'm representing with this thought bubble. So human attitudes and perceptions and the whole um, intricacy of societal patterns and processes. If you can think of human social structure uh, and how that influences landscapes on regular rhythms daily and otherwise our schools, our institutions, the decisions that are associated with those how that influences where people go and what they do, all those aspects are important components of urban ecosystems as well. And I'll give you an example here to illustrate my point. My students and I recently came up with or proposed the likable, therefore abundant hypothesis. And so the idea here is that 
people will exhibit uh, marked likability for certain bird species um, and dislike for other bird species based on what those bird species look like and how they behave. And that's supported by research in the literature. And so we surveyed about 300 undergraduate students at UNC Charlotte, and we found that in, indeed, yes, um, students were given a whole slew of species that they would encounter in their backyard and in the suburbs where they lived. And they exhibited a marked preference for small blue birds uh, that were insect insectivores, uh, like the Eastern bluebird. And the least like species from everyone turned out to be the rock pigeon. And so that gave us a little confidence that we were actually on to a real pattern since that's not exactly everyone's most favorite birds so or a regular pigeon that's in our city centers. And so the hypothesis then goes on to posit that people are more likely to make changes to their yard, like putting out nest boxes, bird feeders, or planting particular vegetation to encourage the occurrence of species that they find appealing, that they like. And that these changes taken together over the scale of landscapes are likely to play a fairly big role in the population sizes of the liked species. And so here, this is an interaction between uh, human attitudes and perceptions, and then the population sizes of other species in, in an urban ecosystem. So you can see how the attitudes and perceptions play um, a can play a significant role. So um, thinking about our urban ecosystem, I think we've defined our urban ecosystem. And since we're in that urban ecosystem with all of these relationships going on, you can now maybe see how you can be just as connection, connected to nature in your town or city as elsewhere. So you are surrounded by a wealth of ecological interactions right where you live. And now I'd like to discuss how two implications from you living in an urban ecosystem mean that you can have a real impact on nature where you live and by corollary, these large crises of biodiversity loss and climate change that we're facing. And I'm gonna do that with these two photographs. And my example is centered on the urban heat island effect. So why am I talking about the urban heat island effect? That is uh, an emergent characteristic uh, that is due to urban ecosystem functioning. So the interactions of a variety of different elements in an urban ecosystem. So what is an, uh, the urban heat island effect? That is a very ubiquitous pattern across cities, small and large, whereby air temperatures in cities are higher than they are in the rural areas surrounding cities. And the two immediate causes of those higher air temperatures are that we are replacing a lot of the vegetation in cities with asphalt and concrete to make up our streets our parking lots and our buildings. Those materials are absorbing solar radiation and holding onto it and only releasing it later. So that's heating up the environment. And then we're also producing in cities and suburbs, a lot of waste heat when we heat and cool our buildings and as we drive our vehicles. So that's additional heat that's being created in those places. And those kind of immediate causes of the urban heat island effect are the product of several different elements interacting in complex ways. We can think of land use decisions being influenced by economic forces, uh, being influenced by planning policies and zoning ordinance ordinances, by uh, community wishes in some cases, so community input, 
that influences whether we have an urban heat island effect or not. You can also think of a variety of uh, different things. So the age of our buildings and our roads, the materials that they're constructed from, uh, whether the age of the HVAC systems in the buildings, uh, how much we use those HVAC systems, so the degree to which you crank the AC at home or where you work, the uh, age and maintenance, the age of your vehicle and the maintenance that you put into it, where you live in relation to your work in terms of commuting and how you get around, whether you choose to walk or, or bike or drive on any given day, the development pattern of your city and all the decisions that go into that. And then additional things like the amount of vegetation that your city has in your particular neighborhood, the degree to which you have street trees and whether they're well-maintained, what species they are, and so you can see that there is a variety of different elements that are interacting to create an urban heat island effect. And not any one single thing is determining that you have that urban, urban um, heat island effect. It's the interactions between a variety of things that create the effect. So there's no one single controlling thing that creates it. So to give you that background, my two implications of you living in an urban ecosystem in this really complex web where you live are these. So first looking at our left-hand picture, if we can change uh, landscapes to the extent that this picture demonstrates, so eliminating all but one little tree here in this landscape, and this is a contributor to the urban heat island effect, then we can also change landscapes in a completely different way with just as many implications to with just as large an effect. So we can create biodiverse and nature rich cities that look very different from the picture on the left. And then secondly, because no single person, entity or thing is creating that urban heat island effect, it means that each one of our actions is important in ultimately creating that characteristic of cities. So we are each involved and critically so in making an impact on creating you know, huge changes to our city. So I've got a picture here of a black tupelo I planted last year in my yard, which has turned bright red this fall, which is beautiful. And each of these individual actions matter and make a huge difference to what the environment is like where we live. So that being said, I thought I would spend uh, the rest of my time telling you a little bit more about those actions that you can take um, and how nature impacts you as well. And I'd like to focus on your yard as I do so. So in the book, um, each of the chapters is focused on a space. And the first one that I tackle is your yard. And in those chapters, I look at two relationships between you and nature. So the first one here is how you manage nature in your yard matters just as much or more to birds than how much green space there is nearby. So this is how you're impacting nature in that space. And then I look at the reciprocal relationship. So how does nature impact you in that space? And I'll talk about how experiencing nature in your yard leads to love and care for the environment. So first, if we focus on this first relationship, and I'll focus here first on what I've got on the slide. So how you manage nature in your yard matters just as much or more to birds than how much green space there is nearby. So this is a significant statement. This means that the habitat in your yard for birds is the primary habitat in a lot of cases that your urban and suburban bird community is relying upon. If we think of green space in cities, of the studies that exist, 
uh, that are just looking at where that green space is located, they found that at least a third and sometimes the majority of green space is found in yards in a city, not public green spaces or parks or nature, nature preserves, but it's found in yards. So yards in a lot of cases are where birds are finding the habitat they need. And I'll show you some evidence to support this contention that it's yards that really matter to birds. And that's been collected in a variety of different cities around the world. So in Ottawa, the total number of native bird species, the number of bird species who primarily depend on forest, and the number of threatened species were similarly as dependent on yard vegetation as on public green space. So there's three things to unpack here. One, like I just said, yards are where uh, are at least as important as public green space in Ottawa. So birds are critically depending on yards as habitat in that city. Second, it's not just your regular everyday bird, but the birds that are depending on those yards include native birds, uh, birds that are nominally forest species, and threatened species as well. So species of conservation concern. And then third, and this is an implication of this result, as cities develop, it's often the open space that gets sacrificed to new development. So either whether that's parks or it's just kind of undesignated open space in cities, that fills in with housing as cities develop. develop. That means that your yard, as your city becomes larger and larger and develops over time, becomes more and more important as habitat to the bird communities in your city and suburb as that public green space diminishes. So that's really important as well to realize. And so the additional evidence that's supporting that yards really matter to birds comes from Phoenix, so birds in neighborhoods responded twice as much to habitat features in front yards than to the distance to the nearest tract of desert habitat. In Phoenix, they found uh, about of the, I think 21 desert specialist species, about a third of the desert bird community in yards. In Chicago, the number of bird species counted along residential streets is dependent to a greater extent on the wildlife resources in yards than on the area of open space, including forest preserves within two thirds of a mile. And then in Hobart in Tasmania, garden characteristics had a bigger influence on the number and different types of native birds and the number of woodland birds than distance to native vegetation. And in Hobart, they found six bird species that were endemic to Tasmania and one critically endangered species in yards, the swift parrot. So in addition to yards being central critical habitat to urban and suburban birds, there are, these studies have shown that there are actually very feasible and easy changes you can make to your yard that will have a big impact on birds. So for instance, 10% more yard vegetation in Ottawa in, at the neighborhood scale is predicted to lead to 20% more forest dependent or threatened bird species. So a big bump. In Phoenix, 50% of the desert per, bird community that they observed in yards would be present if yards over the scale of a couple of blocks contain just 10 desert tree species and 20 shrubs. And then in Chicago, if 10% more yards along a street, so one of 10 had at least one plant species with fruit or berries, you'd see two more bird species along that street or is predicted that you'd see two more bird species. So these are very small changes for a big bump in biodiversity. And what are those changes that you could make to your yard, I've collated from that research and other research five simple things you can do to create a bird-friendly yard. First is simply just to add more vegetation to your yard. 
Second, choose plant species that attract birds. The National Audubon Society and the North Carolina Audubon Society have fantastic lists of plants that attract birds, including the particular bird species. Third, diversify the type and structure of vegetation in your yard. You want to aim for some grassy open areas, some herbaceous plants, shrubs of a variety of heights, trees, deciduous and coniferous, and vines, deciduous and coniferous. So the more horizontal and vertical diversity you can provide, the better. Fourth is provide supplemental food for birds. There's research, pretty robust research shows, now shows that bird feeding increases bird population sizes, increases bird um, uh, quality or health, and also may increase bird reproduction if you're feeding over the winter. And then here I've got keep your cat indoors. That is the ideal scenario. It may or may not work for different folks, depending on how you manage your pet. So this is slippers that I've got here with a bird be safe collar. Uh, you can get these on Amazon. They're $12. It's like a scrunchie you put on top of the collar. Independent study has shown that it reduces bird mortality from cats by over 80%. And anecdotally, I've seen that happen with slippers. So I use that with him and I also keep him in at dawn and dusk over the breeding season to minimize any mortality. So now if we look at this second relationship, Experiencing nature in your yard leads to love and care for the environment. The basis of this relationship is something called the extinction of experience. And the extinction of experience was coined by Robert Pyle in 1978 when he returned to a childhood haunt where he had observed butterflies and he found it to be very developed. So it had turned into shopping malls, houses, industry, and he wasn't able to find any of the species that he had seen as a child. And so he defined the extinction of experience. So the extinction of experience is the disappearance of nature experiences, especially among children. And this is happening partly because in some parts of cities, there is no green space, right? So kids and, and adults don't have access to green space. That in the US occurs especially where communities are less wealthy and where they have higher proportions of um, communities of color. So that does happen. There also is the case where in uh, less wealthy neighborhoods, and neighborhoods with greater communities of color that there is green space, but it's not accessible. Either it's not safe, there are a lot of environmental hazards, or there are just no amenities to help people use it. So there is a lack of access to nature in cities. But the other thing that's happening, and as you've probably heard, is kids these days are spending a lot less time outdoors and a lot less time looking at wildlife. So uh, kids in America spend about 22 of 24 hours indoors or in vehicles. And um, the stat that I like to quote is from the National Survey of Fishing, Hunting and Wildlife Associated Recreation, which found that in 1985, 51% of young people aged six to 15 watched wildlife that year. And by 2010, it was down to 31%. So a significant decrease over that 25 year period. So this extinction of experience has implications for people's love and care for the environment, and ultimately as adults, our willingness to engage in pro-environmental behavior and our willingness to take action to address the crises, the environmental crises that we're living through. And so one way to address the extinction experience is to provide nature experiences for kids. So as I finish up here, I just wanted to give one example of a fantastic study that really shows the power of providing kids with nature experiences. This was a study uh, called, a project called Bird Buddies. 
And this was carried out in the UK with eight different classes of kids that were seven to 10 years old. Kids were asked a variety of uh, questions before the program um, about birds. The, the program was feeding birds in the schoolyard. So they're asked a variety of questions about birds before the program and their, their relationship to the environment. And then they were asked the same questions after the program. And the authors found that after regularly watching and feeding birds for six weeks, students were able to identify about twice the number of bird species on average than before they started and reported liking birds a lot more. There were lots of other significant um, effects. Uh, during the six week program period, nearly a quarter of students went bird watching outside of school for the first time. And after the program ended, more than 80% of students wanted to continue watching and feeding birds in the school grounds. And a year later, four of the eight classes were still watching and feeding birds. And teachers observed that the original participants were generally more interested and involved in the environment and environmental activities at school than other students. So this access to nature and exposure to nature as kids increase kids' environmental knowledge, their connection to nature, and spurred pro-environmental behavior. And I'll just mention one um, final result here that I found astounding in this study. So 80% of students that participated in Bird Buddies thought that the act of feeding birds increased the number of species visiting their schoolyards. However, pre and post program monitoring showed that this was not the case. The number of bird species stayed the same. And so this really highlights something I've experienced that if you don't know nature and are not aware of it, then it is effectively grayed out. It's invisible to you. So students in the Bird Buddies program actually thought that there were few bird species in their schoolyards because they'd never interacted with them, even though they were there. And so just the fact of getting to know the species around you can open up this whole new world that's very fascinating, but is absolutely necessary to um, get better connected and develop a strong relationship with nature that we need as a society to, as I said, tackle biodiversity loss and climate change. And in the book, there are a variety of different ways you can get connected with nature, with your kids, and your yard is the perfect place to do that if you're lucky enough to have one because it's right there and there are probably way more species in it than you realize. So you can do fun stuff like going on a backyard safari, constructing a fairy house, going on a nature scavenger hunt, which make a big impact. With that being said, I will leave you with our state reptile. Uh, and I will reiterate these messages that I hope you take home today. So nature is alive and well where you live. You can be just as connected to nature in your town or city as elsewhere. And you can enhance nature at your door. And if you ever want to get in touch with me um, and buy the book, please check out my website and you can connect by email or on Instagram. I love talking about this stuff. I love urban wildlife. So I'm always happy to find like-minded folks. And thank you again for the invitation today. It was a pleasure. Dr. Gagne, thank you so very much. That was awesome. We are going to turn to Q&A now. Uh, so I see we've got some questions coming in in the chat on YouTube. Please feel free to leave your questions in there. We'll get to as many as we can, so I'm gonna jump right in. Our first question is from Carol. Is it legal to feed other wild animals aside from birds? Uh, I think it is. I'm not aware, and, and state folks on the call can jump in. I'm not aware of any problem with that. The only thing uh, you should be aware of is we do have a significant, significant coyote populations in suburbs and cities, even super urban places. And leaving food out, including having bird feeders that are not well kept and kind of cleaned up, has been found consistently to attract coyotes to yards if they're willing to go in a yard. So that's something to keep aware of. 
Awesome. I had a couple of questions uh, myself as well. So folks continue to leave questions in the chat, but I was wondering, um, and this might be a little biased because of course I work as an environmental educator, um, but all of us who have maybe young people in our lives or even adults who may um, hold some misconceptions about wildlife um, and about the idea that we live and exist as a part of nature, in your opinion, how can we best share the message that ecosystems aren't static, but in fact are in flux? How can we share that with the world? That's an excellent question. <laughs> um, I think getting out there and uh, if you can, observing changes. So, you know, what comes to mind, it's fall. So we can certainly observe changes with the trees, but maybe actually spending some time in a forest and looking at the changes that occur and talking about them. Uh, with my students, I recently started doing um, kind of nature reflection. So asking them to sit in a natural space without their phone, without anything and just to observe what is going on around them for 20 minutes. And I've had a phenomenal response from that with students just, just being amazed at like all the things that are happening around them and how they can do that. So finding processes that occur over time, like maybe looking at frogs metamorphosing, but spending the time to learn about that, I think is important. Absolutely, I could not agree more. Um, we have another question from Troy who said you didn't mention chemicals. How do you feel about herbicides and pesticides in the urban environment? I think you briefly mentioned at one point um, the things that we put into our yard, right. fertilizers and whatnot, but can you go into a little more detail about that? I do not like herbicides and pesticides at all. So uh, I don't use those in on my property with the single exception that I have uh, found it very difficult when I've, I've replaced some lawn on my property and I haven't put enough plants in. So I've found it difficult to control weeds or invasive species uh, with non-chemical means. So I've had to do a little bit about that. I think that is, I think herbicides and pesticides are vastly overused. They're a significant contributor to the insect apocalypse. So the significant decline in insect populations that we're observing. Uh, and I think I think they have implications for human health as well. So I'm, I don't see much uh, benefit, but I think my approach would be they can certainly be reduced. If somebody doesn't want to stop using them altogether, I think the amount can certainly be reduced. Well, thank you for that. You mentioned Audubon earlier, uh, but do you have any other suggestions for good sources or just ways to look and see if a source is reputable? I know looking online, especially when it comes to wildlife questions, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of misinformation out there. So how do we sniff out the good sources? I, I have found great success with the North Carolina Audubon Society, the local Audubon chapters, the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, their local chapters, uh, extension information from NC State, for example, uh, and uh, the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. And to be honest, I've relied almost exclusively on those sources from the state, and they provide a huge wealth of information. I mean, I've not really had to go elsewhere. So I would rely on those sources. And you probably have folks with local chapters of Audubon or Wildlife Federation in your suburb or city that you can contact directly as well. Mm -hmm. I personally want to emphasize state resources. NC State Extension Services is a great place to go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, especially botany, especially if you're interested in planting. That's what I was going to uh, say. For native. plant stuff, it's excellent. Mm -hmm, definitely. Um, <clears throat> this next question makes me think of the book, Last Child in the Woods, but has there been any research on rural children and the extinction of experience that you mentioned? It seems there would be, they would be subject to some of the same issues today due to development, screen time, schedules, et cetera. I'm not, um, I'm not sure in my research that I distinguished uh, just looking at like time spent outside between urban and rural populations. And I'm not uh, immediately aware of any studies that that made that differentiation, but I agree. So part, 
a significant reason for the extinction of experience is a lot more time spent indoors. And as I said, I'm a mother of a young child and it he certainly spends more time indoors than I did as a kid. Just the societal norms and what we do from day to day has changed. So it's not an easy thing to change, um, but it's certainly possible. So with intention, I think it's definitely possible. Awesome. I'm personally curious to know, how did you get into this field? What has your career path looked like, especially for any young people who might be tuning in, um, especially those who might be considering going into a career in ecology, environmental education? Uh, Do you have any advice slash how did you get into this field? I think uh, I was certainly lucky enough to be able to follow my interests. So I've always been interested in being outdoors, interested in animals. Uh, My dad took me out into nature very frequently. So every weekend. So I was exposed to a lot of it as a kid. I found it fascinating. uh, And I chose to pursue looking at animals in undergrad, my undergraduate degree. And then uh, after my undergrad, I volunteered a lot. So I participated, I did an internship with the Sierra Club in Canada, volunteered with some NGOs looking at wetland protection. And I think that helped me hone what I really wanted to do. So then I got into graduate school and was able to really focus on a question that I was interested in. So uh, try to find what you like to do, find a way to do it. It's not easy, but follow that really closely and then get out into the world. So definitely a variety of experiences, I think, is important. Awesome. Um, And of course, you mentioned iNaturalist and some other ways to get involved. I wanted to mention citizen science as well um, is a great way to if you're looking for ways to get yourself outside and aren't quite sure where to start. um, Those were some great, great um, options. So we'll finish up here with a last question. I wonder if you could go into some more detail on some of the challenges that our urban wildlife faces. Um, What are some of the things that may, of course, you touched on this, but that may hold them back? Um, Of course, the one that sticks in my mind is perception. You wrote likable, therefore abundant hypothesis, uh, which makes me think of the need for um, environmental education. (laughs) But can you talk about some of those challenges that our urban wildlife faces? Sure. I think I'll focus on things that that we each are are intimately, you know, people are intimately involved with. I think there are a lot of sources of mortality for wildlife in cities. Uh, And so you can think of roadkill. Uh, You can think of bird window collisions. So uh, those happen a lot during migration. Turning your lights off at night during migration period is really uh, important. And the North Carolina Audubon and National Audubon have lots of resources related to that. Uh, You can also think of, uh, like we said, pesticides and herbicides that lead to mortality. So there are lots of things that are within our control that we can impact. And then in the book, I also touch on city level processes. So our planning policies and zoning ordinances that have to do with how much vegetation there is along our streets, in our parks, uh, just broadly in our neighborhoods is somewhere that we need to focus. And so thinking maybe about protecting 30% of city area as habitat if we can, and actually implementing a policy like that would go a really long way to promoting the health of wildlife, but human health as well. Well, we will have to wrap it up there. Dr. Gagne, thank you so much. This was such an interesting lecture, especially because it relates to things that we see every day. Um, Really enjoyed it. Thank you again. Thank you so much. I had a great time. And thank you to those of you who are tuning in with us online live. Um, If you're watching this later on, that's awesome. You can join us for our live lectures. Be sure to tune in next week 
we will be meeting um, our next guest, Dr. Kelly Oten, and we'll be talking about forest entomology. So feel free to tune in next Wednesday, the 15th. Um, be sure to sign up for the lunchtime lecture series email list so you'll never miss a new guest lecture. Check out the chat in the YouTube um, link because we do have a link in there for your social media handle and a link to review more about your work and access your book as well. Great. I'm Erin Apple. Thank you so much, everybody. And make sure to come out to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences soon. We are a free facility and we would love to have you come. So if you'd like to learn a little bit more about the wildlife in your backyard, come out and meet people like myself. We are here to teach you all about it. Thanks everyone. Have a great day.